Welcome back to another episode of Casey Campbell's Videocast. Of course, I'm Casey Campbell with Great Lakes Post. And whenever we bring this guy on, you know there's big news. And of course, the MHSA announced yesterday the football, soccer, volleyball, girls swim and dive, and every other fall sport is back. Um, I think the biggest one, obviously, football reinstated. Of course, that's Mark Ewell, the MHSA Executive Director. Mark, thank you so much for taking some time to join us. I know you've been... Uh, very, very busy the last few days, and especially uh, over all across uh, media networks all across Michigan. You bet, Casey. Good to be with you. Well, let's start with the obvious. Football is back. Let's go. Was football ever off the table to be, to be brought back? Because two weeks ago you announced that we're going to play in the spring. And then Monday we hear that, okay, maybe football could be back in the conversation. And then, um, and then yesterday, of course, now it is back. Was football ever out of the conversation? Uh, I don't know that it was ever out of the conversation. Um, you know, the really, the really quick summary of this whole thing is we spent the month of July uh, working on uh, the plans for fall sports, the, the return to competition, which were given to us by the governor's roadmap, which uh, became effective on June 30th. Well, the big curveball that we all got on the last day of July was Executive Order 160, which said that social distancing must be um, required at all times. And then what we had to do was ask a number of different questions uh, to get interpretations of, of 160. Um, and it was in that process that the low risk sports of golf, tennis, and cross country were approved. Um, it was uh, also provided that the moderate risk sports of swim and volleyball, those practices could start, but in most of our state, the indoor facilities weren't yet available. Um, soccer could not compete in most of our state. And then the last thing that 160 did was it took our, our week of helmets only football practice and prevented us from taking the next step to fully padded practice and then obviously games. So, um, since the, our council made the decision on August the 14th to postpone football, which by the way, um, we were out of runway. Um, that was on a Friday and the following Monday would have been the first day that all teams had to move to padded practice. And we, ha we had to make a decision. Um, and based on the law, there was no other decision to be made. So as we've continued to communicate here over the last three weeks. And by the way, back on the 14th of August, we were told that a, a new order was going to be coming very shortly and it was going to deal with um, a number of different athletic issues. Well, of course, it was, you know, the, the first order that, that came was the one yesterday, um, almost three weeks later. So what the new order does do is it does remove uh, the restrictions now to any specific sports. Um, there's a lot of guidance in the document about size of spectators and those things. But um, as we've said all along, the, the thing that really brought four of our fall sports to a stop was Executive Order 160. And uh, now that 160 has been replaced by 176, we're ready to move forward. Now, a lot of things, and there's a lot of stuff I want to get with you today. But Executive Order 166, of course, Executive Order 176, uh, something that came up to me by many people was the issue of masks. I was uh, got some clarification saying that. Is it true that football, soccer, volleyball, all those sports, do they have to wear some sort of face covering when they are competing on the field? So that's actually, I think we all know what the order says, and it does say facial coverings except for swimming. Um, but we've already had conversations uh, this morning with the governor's office uh, looking for some interpretations because um, golf, tennis, and cross country, they've been competing um, now for, for at least two weeks. Uh, we've had cross country kids, um, <laughs> you know, who've been running 3.1 mile. And by the way, we haven't had any uh, outbreaks or shutdowns in any of those three sports that have been competing. We've had um, you know, we've had volleyball kids up north now competing um, for a week without any masks. So th that's something we're just trying to get some clarification on is, you know, was, was the mask requirement um, for those sports that were approved under 176 to move forward. So um, those are some questions we're actively seeking answers on as we speak. 
And that was a, a provision of the order, Casey. And by the way, yeah, we, we have, we've had communication, but the first time that we saw the order was at three o'clock yesterday, just like everybody else. So um, that was a little bit of a, um, that was newsworthy. We didn't, uh, had no indication that that was gonna be part of the order. And now we're just trying to, to get some um, interpretation and guidance about what that exactly means. Yeah. So, um, so do they have to? So do they have to wear the the face coverings? Like, so if I go to a soccer game, do should I expect to see kids wearing like some sort of covering their mouth and nose during competition? So we don't know. That's that's part of the guidance we're looking for. Okay. Um, we know what the order says, um, but yet with one hundred and sixty, I mean, it was a series of questions. Um, it's really no different. You know, we pass a rule or a regulation, what we include in our handbook and really the, the biggest part of our handbook, it's actually giving interpretations of, well, here's what the rule means. And uh, you know, what we're really looking at here in the EO is, is one sentence and we know all what it says, but yet um, what does that actually mean? What was the intention? Does that um, retroactively apply to golf, tennis and cross country? So um, again, we, we're going to do everything we can here to be good partners, and uh, that's some information. Once we get it, uh, we'll be ready to move ahead. Okay. Um, also, you know, obviously, soccer can start right away. Obviously, swim and dive and volleyball can start, I'm, if I'm correct, on Wednesday. Correct. Yep. Um, football, I kind of want to go into a little bit because, you know, with that. So teams can hand out equipment from today until Labor Day. And then Tuesday, I think, is the first practices with the shells. Correct. Um, just explain how football will work from starting on Tuesday sure. until that first game on the 18th. So our schools all had a full week of practice in helmets only that got in during the week of August the 10th. Okay. Um, currently, football is under a dead period. That was from yesterday's announcement um, until Tuesday. We will let um, – Kids come in, you know, with coaches over the weekend simply to issue and, and pass out equipment. Um, we didn't think it would be fair that here the order comes out at three o'clock on Thursday um, that addresses a sport that uh, had been postponed um, on a holiday weekend. And uh, we just thought it was the most equitable thing to do to just to say, okay, from here until next Tuesday, we're in a dead period. And then everybody gets to restart on the same day. And because we've had the helmet only week, which far exceeds what our minimum uh, rules would be require, we're going to let school start in shells, which means that it's just, it's a helmet shoulder pads. And then after two days, so on Thursday, they'll be able to add football pants. And now it essentially is full contact work. And then the first allowed day of competition would be that following week, which would be Thursday, September 17th. And uh, the first Friday night would be uh, September 18th. September 18th. Um, so going into that, so they would start with their week four opponent, six game season, everybody makes the playoffs. So teams would get at least seven guaranteed games. Well, you know, um, I'm going to use, but at my next question is involving the Lansing area. I, I know that many schools in that area have opted out, um, looking at some of the area teams, um, I think I was looking at, I think DeWitt had like three opponents that have opted out. I think uh, as of now, obviously they can change, but what could a school like that do? Um, it, it's DeWitt, I don't think is the only one. I think Waverly, I think, and some others as well. What can schools do if they have those opt outs, um, they have those like open games? What are they going to do there? What can they do? So the, the suggestion was that schools would just pick up their schedule with week four because Casey, in many, many cases, once you get into week four of the football season, you're really in your league schedule. So if there needed to be any juggling or modifications, uh, more often than not, it's going to be with a league opponent. However, we also know that some schools um, have already said we're not going to play football. We're going to have, I'm sure, some other schools that may choose to opt out moving forward. Um, and we know that, that that's just a sign of the time. So schools will have some flexibility to rearrange some scheduling if they have to because they've lost an opponent. Um, and if you know their, their league schedule allows that. The biggest thing is by putting everybody in the playoffs, if a school now suddenly has 
an opening that they didn't expect to have. If a school, for example, has to miss a game or even two games because of a positive case or because of a quarantine, that that isn't going to be dependent on them getting in or not getting in to the football tournament at the end of the year. So it was really important to, to pro if nothing else, to really reduce some of the scheduling pressure during this uh, shortened regular season. Um, and the thing is, we might find some parts of this because now if, if I have an opening week six of the season or, or uh, three weeks into the restart, um, now there really isn't any disincentive for me to go out and to schedule a, another school, maybe two or three divisions larger than me, and it, maybe it's a perennial power, because if I don't win the game, I'm still in the playoffs. I'm still going to start with my four-team district. I know who I've got to beat to keep advancing in the tournament. And maybe some of the uh, struggles we've had with regular season scheduling, maybe we might even learn some things here. But one other thing, um, Casey, with us going with six weeks in the regular season, with then everybody in and guaranteeing seven games, um, in almost no spring football model could we have done this well. Um, putting it down to paper to find a six-week regular season with two weeks of practice leading into that, and then to have a postseason. Um, you know, we were looking at some four- and five-week schedules in the spring just because weather in our state is such a challenge. So even though, yes, I, I certainly wish we could have been uh, practicing and, and playing here over the last uh, 21 days, the reality is that wasn't able to happen. We've now gotten the approval to do so, and we're ready to get restarted. And even though it'll be a little bit of a shortened season, we still think it's going to be the best experience we can give kids. I also want to, um, you know, asking about the, if a school does decide to opt out, will there be a spring season available for them, even though they may not be going for a championship? Yep. So schools actually for a long, long time, uh, have already had the ability to do that. So if schools that wish not to play this fall, they can play a sport later on in the school year. The only caveat to that is they could do a, a local regular season schedule, but yet they don't get any postseason. And by the way, if your school does participate in the sport, let's say it's football in the fall, that doesn't allow you to also have a spring season of even just a few games. So school districts will need to pick one or the other. And those that choose not to play this fall, that, that's their call on uh, if they want to have a spring season and what that would look like. Um, but our tournament will be held uh, here in the fall. Is there going to be an opt-out date that schools have to opt out by? So it's really going to be more of an opt-in to where we're going to reach out to all of our schools here quite quickly and just ask the simple question. Um, are you in or are you're they in? intending to play football this fall? Because then once we have that data, we can plan what our tournament's going to look like. And then we'll also have the most up-to-date list of those not playing. And, you know, we've already heard this morning of uh, a couple of districts that had opted out of all fall sports earlier um, are now considering uh, that decision and, and they might uh, pick up and resume. So a lot of moving parts here probably over the next week to 10 days. Yeah. Um, also, there were talks that Ford Field's likely not going to host the uh, football state finals. Where how do you think state finals will be conducted? That we haven't gotten to yet. So we're going to start with the number of schools we're going to have playing this fall. We'll then look at, uh, you know, how quickly that we want the tournament to conclude. Um, there could even be a scenario if you have to add some divisions to get the tournament done in a, in a four or five week span. So um, our whole focus right now, at least over the next 10 days, is finding out who's going to play, giving the guidance to get the regular season started, and then Hopefully within the next two weeks, we'll have some of the details of what the playoffs could look like, what the finals could look like. But Casey, I don't see any scenario to where our season ends at Ford Field um, with the number of uh, spectators that we've had in, in past years. It, this is a, a different year. It's unlike any other. And I think uh, our tournaments and all of our sports will probably look that way. So um, let's talk about spectators. I know that's been a big you know, topic of conversation from what you guys said yesterday. It looks like every athlete's going to get two tickets for each. Is that going to so be? It, it's not. I, I think in terms of tickets, I think that's a little bit of the wrong way to look at it. I think schools will determine. Um, it's really taking the participants and then taking that number and now multiplying by two 
and now that determines the number of fans and spectators that you're going to allow in. So if that means that every student does get to, that's going to be the school's call. If it's a case that that's going to be the number, and if we have a, a participant that doesn't have any family or, or parents that are coming to the game, well, then that opens up two more spots maybe for somebody else. But um, I think that the number of participants multiplied by two, that's going to give you your, your number of allowed spectators, and then schools will determine uh, how they're going to handle that. Because, again, you've got lots of different challenges. We understand that, or you've got split families and blended families. But it, it is going to be um, two spectators per participant. And I think it's important to know that we've greatly relaxed any of our streaming and uh, broadcast provisions. So yeah, there may only be two spectators per participant in the venue, uh, but we are going to make our games uh, as accessible as they've ever been for those that want to watch to be able to watch. It just n might not be sitting on that bleacher bench uh, inside the stadium. Um, just to, just out of obvious, I know this is up to the schools, but would you, like cheerleaders, marching band, student sections, would you, if I, if I go to a high school football game to cover it, would I see cheerleaders, would I see the marching band, or would I see a student section? So right now participants is going to mean players and it's going to mean cheerleaders. Um, no bands, um, the student sections, those would all fall under the two spectators per participant. So um, that's the current plan. Certainly know that the two spectator uh, per participant, that's based on, that's for phase four parts of the state. So in the governor's uh, restart plan, uh, it's two per participant in phase four. Now up north, their numbers are 250 inside and 500 outside. And again, I think a good motivator here would be is if we all do our part and the numbers continue to trend in a positive direction that the whole state could be in phase five, well, that now opens it up to a number of 500. So now there could be the conversations about a, a student section. There could be conversations about BAM, but for us getting started, and I understand there's lots of groups in the community connected to football, at the, at the outset here, we've got to try and get our football teams back to activity. We're going to, uh, cheerleaders are connected to that, but uh, and I know that's not going to make uh, certainly everybody happy, but that at least is going to be our starting point with most of the state in phase four. This also applies to boys soccer, volleyball, and all other sports as well. Correct. It's two per participant, both indoor and outdoor uh, in those uh, parts of the state in phase four. Okay. Um, you know, there's been a lot of things out there, and you know that the, the, the recommendations is you could continue with these contact sports, but the, the warder said, we don't really recommend it. So why did you decide to go on, even though it's like, you can continue to play, but we don't really recommend it. So, so kind of went into that. So we've really tried to, and, and despite what you can read out there on social media and online, um, we have tried to remove politics from this entire situation as much as possible. We've tried to be good active partners with the governor's office in following all of the guidance and all of the directions that they've given to us. So it was made quite clear to us that under Executive Order 160, um, those sports could not continue. Um, with issuing 176, that answer changed. Now, the politics and the optics of, okay, we're going to let you do it under the order, but we're now going to have some recommendations and suggestions, um, I think is certainly a mixed message. Um, if there was not confidence that these could go forward and they could be done safely, then don't change Executive Order 160. Um, what you now look at is, okay, now with that being a recommendation, I think you've got to look at the data and information that's out there. Um, an important data point that didn't exist three weeks ago is we're going to become the 34th or the 35th state playing football this fall. Of that group, 25 have already had nearly a month of their schedules already played to where practice and leading into the first two or three weeks of games. And what I hear in those daily, almost daily calls from my counterparts around the country is what a successful start they're having in terms of football and minimizing 
any impact of COVID. What we're hearing in all of those states is that 95% plus of all of their football schools have been able to play in weeks one, two, and three of those seasons, depending on where they're at in their schedule, including our two neighbors to the south, Indiana, which right now is finishing the third week of their season, in Ohio, which is finishing their second week. What I am hearing from those states is that with football teams having a very successful first month in terms of the number of COVID outbreaks and, and when you do have a positive case, how that's being handled, um, they've actually had some other issues with, with volleyball, um, actually more issues with volleyball than with football because we know that every, all, the, all the science and data we've heard about the last six months is outdoor activity is better than indoor activity. And that's certainly something that we, we're gonna do uh, when it comes to football. I think you have to look at those other data points. We hear that the Big 10 is considering restarting their fall football season as early as October. Um, so part of this is, is you know, we've, I understand what the recommendation is, but yet, um, through the medical professionals that we've been in communication with. And by the way, we don't just talk only about COVID, but we talk about COVID, we talk about mental health, we talk about just overall student wellness and how this all factors in. I think you've got to look at it those in entirety. And uh, so I think right now, if we're going to make decisions based on data, um, what we've been able to collect from other parts of the country here over the last month, um, and by the way, Casey, we've said from the outset that we far and away believe that if kids are going to play, they're safest in our programs with professional educators. And uh, if, if we would, you know, continue to stand on the sidelines and just say, you know what, we really don't have any hard data to base this on, um, but yet we're not going to play, um, that actually would run counter to a lot of the data that has emerged around the country over the last month. So we'll continue to communicate and work with all of the state agencies and partners. But um, so it's, again, if this would have been prohibited in this, um, the governor did not want this to be able to happen, then don't do anything to executive order 160. Um, that's not a decision I got to make. That's not even, I was not even asked for my opinion but they um, allowed sports to go through under 176. And uh, that is what uh, our representative council and our member schools uh, chose to do. Um, and then also you kind of look at a, a lot of the other things with, you talked about indoor sports. You know, most all sports in the winter are indoors. And the thing is, if people are like, oh, we shouldn't be playing football. Wrestling just has enough, a lot of contact in itself, and it's indoors. Plus, you also have basketball and hockey and, and all of, and boys swimming and diving. Do we have any, are you have anything on winter sports yet? Or have you guys started to talk about that? So I do think that, um, you know, the, the challenges in the, in the fall are certainly there. And um, we're going to certainly, uh, you know, we think that, that we can address those challenges. Uh, there's probably more challenges with winter sports because as you said, Casey, everything is indoors. Now I do think that ice hockey, for example, to where most players already wear a full face shield. Um, in hockey, with those kids that do wear the, the clear plastic full cage um, or full face mask rather than the cage, there's already a lot of things in hockey where yeah, you do have some contact, but in terms of that you know, respiratory droplets, um, I think you can, there's some solutions there. Yeah, wrestling is gonna be awfully difficult, but yet the thing that you have in wrestling is you're competing against, depending on the size of the event, one, two, three, or four other specific individuals. It's different than basketball to where, depending on who comes down the lane and I try and block their shot, I could be interacting with maybe a dozen different players, both on my same team as well as the other team. So. All of the indoor sports, I think, have some very unique challenges. We need to be really good students, um, I think, this fall and learn a lot of lessons, both indoors and outdoors, uh, that hopefully uh, we'll be able to put into practice when it comes wintertime. All right. Mark Ewell, the Executive Director of the MHSAA, thank you so much for, for uh, talking with us. And uh, we'll be, uh, I'm sure we'll be talking pretty soon because I think there could be now more news coming out if, uh, with this coming out. 
All right. Thanks. Thanks, man. Casey.